Gaming may well be on the precipice of its strangest and perhaps most worrying set of changes yet. And this isn't just a concern held by consumers like you or I, but also people with actual industry experience. The following comes from our developer friend and former Ubisoft employee Tommy Miller and is here to let you know that if you're worried about the future of gaming, well, maybe you ought to be. I'm Sai for WhatCulture.com and here are the 10 biggest dangers to gaming right now from a dev's perspective. Number 10, studio collaboration going OTT. According to Ubisoft Studio Heads in 2015, through inter-studio collaboration, Tom Clancy's The Division would be the world's first quadruple A video game. But surely if the future of gaming could only be achieved with two or even three studios, that would raise a ton of new problems. Where goes the creative control of the devs themselves, let alone the leading studio? Would there be a problem with compartmentalization to avoid overlap? Or is it a case of every involved partner giving feedback to every last bit of development? Several of Tommy's colleagues described The Division as the most stressful project that they'd worked on thanks to these factors. Fast forward to the modern day and Ubisoft's Avatar Frontiers of Pandora seems to have taken inter-studio collaborations to the max, with Ubisoft Massive, Ubisoft Shanghai, Ubisoft Dusseldorf, Lightstorm Entertainment and Foxnet all pitching in to see the project through to its release. If such grand inter-studio products are to be more commonplace in the future, communication problems and meddling from more higher-ups than you even knew existed might create a choke point for development approvals. Number 9. Microtransactions out of control How do those Wiley publishers figure out how to mitigate costs without having to sell 28 million copies? Well, they simply unleash a million moths to eat through your savings, of course, with the teeny weeny bites they refer to as microtransactions. Only now, with the burden of cost rising to the place where reliance on pure sales isn't enough, publishers are investing progressively more time and resources into monetization design, which is just a fancy way of saying how to make players more likely to part with money and more often and after they've bought the base game. Additional transaction shops are becoming so commonplace and obnoxious now that it's not uncommon to find them bursting out of your game's title screen, a few inauspicious pop-ups blocking your view for good measure. But don't assume that this is as far as it can be taken. Some off-the-cuff remarks and patents filled by big publishing companies could spell disaster for the tight-fisted misers among us, with considerations for in-game billboards being for digital goods purchasable with real-world cash, loading screens harboring quick buy options, and any number of sneaky ways to get you to drop another couple of bucks. All of a sudden, that horse armor from Oblivion seems so benign. Number 8. Exploding Costs Grand Theft Auto 6 is set to cost somewhere in the region of $2 billion. $2 billion! Can you even conceive of that much money? Imagine 2 billion Labradors. That's too many Labradors. But just to put that into perspective, if every copy of GTA 6 was sold for $70, that's something like 28 and a half million copies they need to sell to break even. Imagine 28 and a half million Labradors, that's significantly less, but still too many Labradors. When you put it that way, it makes sense why games now cost 70 smackaroos, with talks of them even increasing to 100, but do we really need them to? With AAA games from the bigger publishers now costing hundreds of millions of dollars to stay competitive amidst their contemporaries, it seems like the only way is up from here. The budgets go up, so the prices go up too. But in a global recession, with the real world cost increasing seemingly exponentially, analysts have noticed an uptick in gamers instead choosing smaller indie titles and a significant boost to the until recently absent AA tier. We're all becoming this meme, and I'm not kidding. Number 7. Remakes and remasters eclipsing new titles We all love a bit of nostalgia and I myself am guilty of it too. I was born in 1989, the time of cassette tapes, the Fresh Prince of Bel and when they used to put free gifts in cereal boxes. But nostalgia is also one of the single most effortless concepts for companies to monetize in the gaming sector may well be one of the most relentless offenders. In 2017, remakes, remasters and reimaginings were estimated at around a fifth of bigger publishers' total revenue, but industry analysts believe this could be as much as a quarter by 2026. And you've got to look at it from the perspective of the purse holder. If you can say to your potential customer, how rubbish is this global recession? How rubbish is paying a mortgage and filling out tax forms, huh? Remember when you were younger and you played Crash Bandicoot? Well, here's your childhood again for $60. Here's that feeling. And you know they're going to bite every time. Why on earth would you opt instead to make a brand new game that doesn't have the manipulation factor built in? It makes great business sense then that fewer risks are being taken and more remasters and remakes find their way onto our store shelves. But with that comes a rather stinging caveat. Fewer resources are allocated to new games, new experiences,
experiences for individuals to experience together for the first time. With the world in the state that it is, and most of our bank accounts at that, it can be tempting to only buy the tried and tested games from our youth. But we have to be careful not to overindulge, otherwise we might find that looking backwards is all that we have left. Number 6. AI in Game Development Artificial intelligence has dominated the conversation in technology for the last 12 or so months, and will do so, likely to an even bigger degree, in 2024, unless our lord and saviour Taylor Swift brings the hammer down on it completely. You go, girl. Jokes aside, we should specify that we're not talking about closed system AI, which is built with minimal tasks in mind, like helping to plant foliage in games, but generative AI which is designed or advertised to do bigger chunks of work for you. In practice, sadly, most generative AI systems available now are as potent as they are through underhanded means. Systems like Midjourney are trained on stolen or, quote, scraped images, doing nothing to seek consent on private, protected, or copyrighted works using these to interpolate data points and generate final products you might consider as intricate mashups of those ill-gotten pieces. But the proof is in the pudding. The layoffs in all areas, but junior sectors specifically, have been astronomically high in 2023 and 2024, with generative AI being considered something of a factor. In this wild west of unregulated AI, studio heads are looking purely at costs, and right now if the magic robot can do it all without incurring any legal issues, why would anyone hire human beings other than that pesky intent, context and creativity? After all, it's only art, hmm? Number 5. Junior Roles Disappearing And with all of those robots taking their gerbs, some studios have started what could be considered to be a pretty myopic move. Positioning Gen AI to replace many juniors in environment and prop art, concept art and design, writing and more. This is because most larger studios have an assumed linear progression for their developers, so that is to say a junior tech artist may become an intermediate tech artist and so forth. This is achieved by seniors and leads imparting new information on the juniors to learn specific techniques, pipelines and styles unique to that studio so that they can themselves pass the torch on to developer padawans of their own. However, with generative AI that all falls apart. AI can only deliver within the boundaries of the art it itself has scraped. Technically, seniors could teach individual disconnected gen AIs extremely specific esoteric information to someday succeed them, but by that point it would be easier to, you know, hire actual people. Ugh, who would do that? There may also be the issue of developers hyper-specialising only to be later replaced by Gen AI, leaving them simultaneously without work and with a set of unique square skills that don't fit in the triangle hole needed by another studio. Number 4. Owning Nothing You don't own your video games. And no, I'm not talking about Game Pass titles, I mean all of your games. Super Mario All-Stars, Eternal Darkness, that really scratched copy of Pandemonium you've still got for PS one. You only ever owned the rights to the personal use of your copy. Of course you owned the plastic, you know, the carts and the discs, but the game part, that was never yours. So how is it different now? Well in 1996 you weren't expecting a big Sega emblazoned thug to smash down your door and take your copy of Sonic and Knuckles off you when the Michael Jackson soundtrack license expired. I mean they could have done that, but I can't imagine it would have been very cost effective. But nowadays in a perpetually online world where the games you play are simply temporarily occupied slots on your hard drive, the process to revoke for publishers is just so much simpler. On a whim, the license holders can simply choose to block your access to that data remotely and pow, you're unable to play your $70 game. On the one hand, you could argue that as we're simply buying licenses to access publishers' games, all games are less products and more services. But on the other, they don't sell those services as extremely limited time opportunities. They're counting on us skimming over all of those terms and conditions, telling us our access could be pulled at any time. The future could see this balance of power shifted even further out of the player's hands, changing even single player titles to very transient experiences with limited lifespans. Number 3. Gaming subscriptions mimic TV streaming models If this was a list on the dangers facing TV and film right now, this would also appear because year on year the debate rages about streaming services. Whilst there's been talk for years that it's unsustainable for every major provider to have their own app, the boys at the top that have the lion's share of subscribers might consider accruing costs by delineating further. After all, we have different tiers for how many adverts you don't want to see, why not the specific content on offer? Today it's Disney+, Plus. tomorrow it'll be Star Wars+, Pass, Disney Classic+, Plus, Documentary+, Pass, and Pixar+, Pass, all for $5 a piece. And gaming will almost certainly go down the same route. First, establishing subscriptions as the new primary delivery method, and then hacking them to bits piecemeal so every publisher has one or two subscriptions each. Just imagine finding out that your Ubisoft Mac subscription doesn't have a 
Assassin's Creed Black Flag on it because that's only in the delightfully named Assassin's Creed. So you cough up the extra five bucks thinking, oh, might as well download Assassin's Creed 2 seeing as I'm paying for it, only to discover that that's on the Ubisoft Legends Ezio Editore Pass. TV has become a streaming service catalogue hellscape, gaming is sure to follow. Number two, gaming monopolies. Whether it's a, and I'm grimacing as I say these terms, Sony pony frothing at the mouth to see Microsoft bow out of the console race, or an X bot grinning like a loon at PlayStation losing exclusives, there'll always be a contingent of gamers desperate to see fewer pieces on the board. Yet history has taught us that, at least from the perspective of the average customer, monopolies are always bad. As the giants of the industry grow ever more bloated on the corpses of consumed titan publishers and manufacturers, it's not outside the realms of possibility to see a future where the only games you can play are owned by Apple, Facebook, Microsoft and Google, having absorbed all the competition like insatiable big catamaris. While Microsoft's big acquisition of Activision Blizzard seemed like a once in a lifetime purchase, it might simply be the start of a race to see which behemoth can buy up the most assets in an attempt to win via sheer money attrition. So in the short term, whilst you might get that feeling of superiority that you're in an exclusive club now that your plastic box of choice can play games which another one can't, in the big picture it's a net loss for us all. And number one, the end of the games console. Every gamer has a it was Christmas morning and there was one last big present story, whether it's an Amiga, Mega Drive, Playstation, Xbox 360, Nintendo DS or whatever. We all might have laughed at a Nintendo 64 kid, but we did so out of solidarity. We'd all been there. But gaming is inevitably moving away from the console. Whether it's in a few years or in a decade, so, or maybe even next week if you ask Xbox. Eventually the need to have a specialised gaming box will be a redundant concept, because we'll all just access all of our games anywhere, likely on a smart TV and or a phone. Technology is advancing so rapidly that consoles ostensibly become outdated the day that they're released. Arguably this could be a good thing, as it's better for the environment in theory, drives down production costs, and in general may be beneficial in ways we can't even predict when it comes to the lines drawn between generations. It's also also another way that we are separated from gaming. We talked about not owning the games you spend money on, how about the entire platform you're subscribed to? And it also just means less videos of hilarious and kind of heartwarming joy like Nintendo 64! <laughs> it's a classic.